Hi guys, my name is Amish Tripathi and I am the director of uh, the Nehru Centre. The Nehru Centre is the cultural wing of the Indian High Commission uh, in the UK and we uh, we have been in existence for many decades and we organize wonderful events at this very auditorium uh, which is in Mayfair in central London. Sadly, as you can see, the auditorium is empty. It has been empty uh, since we were all uh, put into lockdown uh, due to the coronavirus uh, pandemic. Uh, but what we Indians believe is that the other side of a crisis is an opportunity. And what we have done at the Nehru Centre is moved all our events online. So now if you attend our online events, every single seat is a VIP seat. Like you get a front row uh, at our events, no trouble of parking, no trouble of travelling all the way. Uh, and most practically all the programs that we would do like uh, literary discussions and, and and uh, dance performances, musical performances, we are doing them all uh, on our online uh, channels. You can register at, uh, for our newsletter at our uh, website uh, nehrucenter.org.uk. You don't need to write them down, they will be displayed at the bottom of the screen. You can also come to our uh, Facebook page, which is a verified page, the Nehru Center. You can follow uh, updates on all our events on uh, Twitter as well, the Nehru Center, that's also a verified account. Or you can come to our YouTube channel, again, the Nehru Center. We are uh, nothing if not consistent. Uh, I hope you do uh, come to our online channels and enjoy uh, the events that we are putting up for you. Uh, thank you so much for all your love and support. Namaste. Jai Hind. Namaste, my name is Amish Tripathi, as you just saw in the video uh, earlier. I'm the director of, uh, of the Nehru Center and this is our first program of uh, this new year, uh, 2021. And we continue to organize uh, online programs and we are very delighted of the first one uh, that we are, uh, the first event that we are putting up for you uh, this year. Uh, it is on uh, Lord uh, Meghna Desai on his autobiography, which I've thoroughly enjoyed reading. This is the book uh, and uh, all of you must check it out. It is available both in India and here. And if we could bring Lord uh, Meghna uh, on stage, please. How are you, Lord Meghna? Hello, hello. How are you? Nice to see I'm you. I'm well, I'm well. You know, before we start the, uh, the conversation, uh, let me get the formalities out of the way, we are a Sarkari organization, so there will always be formalities. Let me do the formal introduction of Lord Meghna Desai for the benefit of all of you. That Most of you would know him in any case. But Lord Meghna Desai was associated for 38 years with the London School of Economics, where he was Professor of Economics and Director of the Center for the Study of Global Governance from 1991 to 2003. He retired as Emeritus Professor of Economics and was made Honorary Fellow of the LSE. He joined the British Labour Party in 1971 and served as Chairman of the Islington South and Finsbury Constituency Labour Party between 1986 and 1992 and was made its lifetime president. He was elevated to the House of Lords in June 1991. Lord Desai was Chairman of the Gandhi Memorial Statue Trust which helped raise the statue of Mahatma Gandhi in London's Parliament Square. I'm sure many of you have seen it. It's one of the most beautiful statues of uh, Mahatma Gandhi that I've seen anywhere. He is currently chairman of the advisory board of the official Monetary and Financial Institutions Forum. And Lord uh, Desai has written over 30 books on economics, history, politics, and cinema, as well as fiction. 30 books. That's almost three times as the number of books that I've written. He has also written columns for several newspapers and periodicals in the UK and India. He divides his time between London, Delhi and Goa. He received the Pravasi Bharatiya Puraskar in 2004 and the Padma Bhushan, uh, India's third highest civilian award in 2008. What a glittering CV, Lord Meghnath. What an honor to have you on our platform. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> a great pleasure to, to be talking to you. I have written 30 books, but they have sold 130th of what your 10 books have sold. 
but okay lord meghna let's start right from the beginning uh, from all good yeah. places from badodra from baroda uh, as one discovered you know as one uh, read your book your childhood was in baroda and yeah. for those of you who don't know it's a it's a pretty lovely town in in the state of gujarat uh, in western india and lord meghna were you a, from a typical gujarati family and uh, what was your childhood like and we have uh, read that you showed early signs of genius that would have put a lot of pressure on you what is your early childhood like what is baroda like well you know baroda is actually a gem of a city actually the old city of course now it expanded very much there's an oil mm. refinery and all that but when i was growing up it was a gem of a city and we were living right in the center of it at a crossroads yeah. one road leading to the palace another road leading to the uh, to the justice courts you know and it really was in like you were in the center center of the world uh, and of course there was a king and there used to be sawaris you know twice a, twice a year for the ganesh chaturthi and for dashera and our flat was on the second floor so you could wow. see the elephant you could see the king sitting on the elephant right at your level and then people wow. used to come to the house just to stand in the in the balcony to be able to see those uh, those sights so no it was it is very very nice uh, i know of course uh, my 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 education uh, okay. started at home more or less when i was about 3 or 4 i forget you know when no primary school i skipped the first two and then hmm. seven years i was in secondary school so okay. much of my, rest of my life has been in school and college and school <laughs> wow well i when you shifted your family shifted from there to mumbai and That's one right. can imagine the change because even in those days mumbai was and then bombay was you know truly a big city yeah, you know, my father sir my father's sarkari job moved hmm. to bombay because the baroda sarkar was integrated thanks to sardar patel uh-huh. into into the indian union and so we we moved and of course it is you know, moving from a small uh, beautiful town like baroda to the big city of uh-huh. of bombay and you know with commuting and buses and this and that i mean it was uh-huh. a big change uh-huh. uh, but i would say that i benefited most from it because uh-huh. i had not yet fully formed my baroda personality <laughs> i could be a bombay immediately <laughs> and Oh, and in Bombay, of course, housing is always a problem. You get into small places, things like that. But you know, mm. the nice thing was I had a very loving family. Of course, we were all you know over-educated. There's only way I can say it. Always <laughs> about books and political arguments and things like that. Uh-huh. So it was it was a large family. You know, all of you were. Uh, single uh, we were not a joint family but there are a lot of un- uncles and aunts and cousins uh, to uh, to meet every day and uh, it's very nice very friendly and but, uh, uh, always addicted to studying always addicted to study yeah, worsh- so, worshippers of goddess saraswati rather than goddess lakshmi absolutely no no <laughs> lakshmi lakshmi never visited us we were with saraswati <laughs> <laughs> but i mean one of the things that i discovered about you that i didn't know you were into theater i honestly didn't know that and but, and did the theater please. circuit lose a wonderful director when you start chasing economics well uh you know the problem is with the theater uh it's very insecure Uh-huh. when i was doing amateur theater there were stars people who become stars in the gujarati professional theater later on uh-huh. i could see that you needed an enormous ego to be able to stand the insecurity of a theatrical life and you know i come from a babu family you had uh-huh. to be secure in your job the first thing is, is your job pension pension is there or not what is the retirement age no i think uh, i should have been able to combine the two hmm. had i come back to india i may have just become a 
IAS officer or something like that, or a professor, and then combine the two. Because you see, in India, you have home help, you have other things, you have spare time. Whereas mm -hmm. living in London, you mm -hmm. commute and you shop and you cook and all those things. But I'm still, I'm still very fascinated by the theatre because it is a, it is a big in live, much more than films, being a live medium. Mm. When I was doing it, every day would be different. You'd be the same dialogue one day. People would be laughing and clapping. Second day, they'd be sitting there glum. And you say, Michael, what's going wrong? You know, and you panic. But theater, theater is great fun. Theater, I, I like reading plays. I like uh, translating plays, writing plays, and acting. I do you want to and do you want to tell someone? Do you want to tell our audience of something that you've written, which is available on the web, which they can check out? You know, I'm I'm not I'm not the web type. Uh, but uh, quite a lot of the stuff I have written uh, in theater were mainly in, in Gujarati in, in, in those okay. days. Uh, this uh -huh. is back to the 1950s. I translated Ibsen, Henrik Ibsen's Doll's House. I translated uh, Tennessee Williams, um, you know, Glass Menagerie. Uh, I translated Dialogue for Murder, from uh -huh. which Hitchcock made a film. Uh, uh -huh. And I got a, a prize for that. Uh, and then, then uh, what do you call it in Gujarati? Dial M for murder. What do you call it in Gujarati? Yeah, we, we call it adaptation, not translation. Rupantar. Ah, okay. It's called Rupantar. <laughs> uh, and so I was Rupantar car. Uh, ah. And then when I went to America, I I very luckily was able to join into a a, a local theater group, and so these are sort of minor parts in that, you know, ah. Uh, ah. and. Uh, and then when I came back to London, I also started helping somebody do Gujarati plays, Patani Jod by Prabhupada Joshi, which is a great uh, play. And then I got too busy, so I had to do a theater. Do you miss it? I do miss it. I do miss it. But, you know, my life is so busy. Uh, ah. Even now, you know, I mean, ah. you, you don't write 30 books uh, just in your, in your, in your spare time. <laughs> <laughs> all goes away. Uh, uh -huh. But I, I love writing. I love writing. I wish I could write more plays, but I just love writing books. Fascinating. Like well, talking to yourself. Yeah, yeah, true, uh, true, true. Okay, but I mean, from, okay, moving on from there, from Mumbai, your yeah. lovely days there, your, uh, you know, uh, uh, different experience, big city, theater, and you went abroad. Yeah. What made you? And in those days, it wasn't so common, unlike unlike today. It was a big step. Uh, what made you decide to go abroad, and why the U.S.? Why not U.K.? You know, one of the interesting thing at that time, nineteen fifties, was the Cold War. Mm -hmm. India was the targeted by both Russia and the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, Russia, of course, Communist Party, you know, theory and all that. But the Americans used to play upon our our hobbies and so on. So mm. theater, I used to get theater arts as free magazine. But then some senior fellows in uh, Mumbai and the Bombay University started going abroad. Now, mm. I, I went to US, but not UK, because UK had no fellowships. Oh. You needed your own money to go to UK. Mm. Whereas America, I had, I didn't spend a single penny except for travel there. Mm. I was completely looked after. So wow. at the age of 21, I mm. had enough money for the rest of my life to, you know, but then I got jobs and so on. So I ah. was no longer dependent on my parents, mm. you know, from, from 21 onwards. So mm. that was the reason why I went to America. I, mean, I could have gone to I had heard more about British universities, Oxford and Cambridge, LSE, mm. and so on. But the Ford mm. Foundation, in its kindness, gave me enough money to go to Pennsylvania. So there I was in Pennsylvania. And I've never regretted that. You don't have any fears, any second thoughts? I mean, the we are talking about the 1950s. You know, it was difficult yeah. to remain in touch. Phone calls were difficult. I mean, didn't you have any hesitations? I know, actually, it's one of those things that you you think forward. You don't look mm. backward when you are at that age. 
my the thing was I had I had to I had to get to you know other friends had done it. It's mm. when I got to America mm. that I realized no telephones. Yeah. There is no way I could. My my family didn't have a telephone anyway. There's no way <laughs> I could call back. I mean, in mm. India at that time, even calling from Bombay to Baroda was a problem. Uh, yeah. You know, and uh, so for the first time, I was entirely on my own. Mm. If any, if I had any problem, I had no uncle, no aunt, nobody mm. to ask. Mm. I just had to solve my own problems, mm. and. That I think that shaped me quite a lot, because you mm. know in India when you're growing up there are support mm. support structures, your uncles and aunts and you can if you don't if you quarrel with your father you can go and ask your uncle and he will reconcile everybody. So, mm. or you know if you if you had, if you needed money you go to somebody ask. Nothing. I had my fellowship, two hundred dollars a month, and mm. that's what I had to manage in. Mm. And uh, and I managed somehow mm. or other. I managed, and that made me very independent. From mm. early on, I became kind of a on my own sort of person. But that was a, both a great training and, of course, a loss because when you grow up in a family, had I stayed in India and gone mm. into IAS or something, mm. I would have had the, all the support structures and you know. Uh, I would have been a different person, but mm. here I am. You take your decisions, you take their consequences. But you I take no their regrets. consequences. That's that's a beautiful dynamic way. Do you think that it was the decision to go there that made you a rebel, or were you rebellious from the word go? No, I was not rebellious from the word go. No, that was not. I mean, in a sense, I was slightly devious because deviant, because uh, I started reading books which nobody else was reading. You know, mm. I would just I would spend my I had a morning college, all afternoon I was in a library, and I'd wander mm. the library stacks. After a while, they let me, and whenever mm. I saw a book which I had not heard of the name of the author, I said I must mm. read this, <laughs> whether it was my, my subject or not. So I read French authors and history books of different kind, which was not the way people people behaved. People mm. behaved kind of properly, narrowly. I just I was on my own. I became very individualist, mm. and that that is what brought me into Ibsen. I was able mm. to read Ibsen at the age of sixteen because oh. somebody had told me, "Have you heard of Bernard Shaw? You must read Bernard Shaw." So I said, okay, I'm in Bernard Shaw. So looking in a library, I found this book by Bernard Shaw on Ibsenism. I thought, well, what's uh, this? What's Ibsenism? So then I got this uh, thing out. So in that way, I just let myself go. I didn't mm. say, no, no, stick to your studies, you know, exams. And I said, no, let's, let's have fun in the library while, while you can. And so that's how I discovered it. So I was 16, I was completely bowled over. And nobody in my college had heard of Ibsen. Mm. Adventurous. Uh, yeah. adventurous. Very adventurous, very adventurous, very deviant, but you know, in a kind of scholarly way, quiet. Yes. <laughs> no, adventure is not just about martial arts. It can be about uh, scholarship as well. So, but tell me one thing. I mean, going to the, sorry. No, please. No, please go ahead. No, I mean, I'm talking about, you know, going to the US. I just want to explore this a bit more. You write a bit of it as well, because Going to the U.S., you know, in the 1950s, um, did you face any racism in those days? I can only imagine the difficulties. It's so much easier now, you know, to, to go abroad. How did you make friends? What was the experience like outside of your scholarly work? You know, what, what, that's a very interesting question that, that you asked. It is quite interesting that uh, in the early 60s, I got there. I got that rather early, and as I described in my in my autobiography, in the foreign student office, I saw a little poster saying "Wanted someone to act," you know, uh, in a play. So I just called these people up, and it was a white suburban um, theater group. They adopted me like you know I was a long lost uh, brother, 
you know, in a sense, being not black, but brown or whatever, wheat colored, mm. as we say in India, mm. they had no problem with me because the usual racial barriers, I was not part of that. Had I been a black American boy, I might mm. have felt much more discrimination, but I was not. I was kind of in between. And so all my life, and people find it very hard to believe, all my life, I have uh, never faced any racial discrimination, ever. Neither in UK nor in US. Now, you know, it is, I have, I have fought political battles with people uh, yeah. on racism and things like that, but that's my choice. You know, uh, I, for example, in Berkeley, I joined the civil rights demonstrations just because I had to do that. I, like a lot of other Indian students would say, no, no, this is a Pradeshi ki baat hai. Ghar pe baito. Or, you know, <laughs> not me, not me. You know, I'm sort of a, that way, rebellious, you know, individualist, deviant. That That is me. Yeah, the, the myself. But the typical Indian attitude is if there's a fight going on, at least those of us who immigrate, uh, who come abroad, I don't want to be a part of that fight. That's a typical Indian attitude. Is your fight, there's a fight going on, I want to go and join the fight. Is that your attitude? See, my attitude is become like the natives. Join the ah. natives. Hmm. Wherever you are, the native. You see, what you, what in all the Indian student groups I, I came across in, in Philadelphia, they hmm. stuck to other Indians. Mm. They would all eat together, they would talk together. They very seldom mixed with uh, the Americans. Mm. Uh, and I'm from the day one, mm. I was I was not going to be like that. I was going to join the natives and become mm. like the natives. That was sort of, but you know, in a sense, what's interesting about Indian consciousness is mm. we think of ourselves as white. Mm. You know, when an Indian middle class, at least Indian okay. middle class, upper caste people think uh, they're white. Oh, you know, okay. so I had no hesitation. I, of course, made friends with black people and white people. That was not a problem. Uh, but I certainly, maybe I'm just been lucky. I never hmm. faced any uh, racial discrimination anywhere. Not in, not in UK, not in US. Fascinating. You know, in a way, Lord Meghnath, you're saying you rebelled by actually, in a way, complying with what was the native culture, in a way. Yeah. It's a very fascinating thing. Mixing, yeah. mixing in, mixing yeah. in, going yeah. native. <laughs> and, you know, in a, I, I was, I had Indian friends as well. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying I was uh, aloof uh. From, from my fellow Indians, but, uh. so, you know, it, it's one of those uh, nice experiences. I only had myself to guide me. Ah. No mentors. Silly. I, I Fascinating. just guided myself. Fascinating. Many years later, I must tell you this story. Many years later, we were having a meeting in UK about ah. minority and all that. And someone ah. said, describe your experience of racial discrimination. So I said, I haven't had any. He says, you can't say that. I told me I can't say that. I'm talking about, you know, <laughs> We will, we will not, we will not include you in our, in our book. I said, okay, don't include me in your book. <laughs> but you know, I happen to be like that, and I know it's a, it's, it's one of those, one of those things. Uh, I, 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 at that time, somebody came to me in my, in the Labour Party in my, in my uh, town area, and they said, uh. you know, make not what it is like to be made redundant. Uh, hmm. And I thought, I thought, who is this man? I have to tell this man, I have never ever been made redundant, and I'm <laughs> never going to have a unemployment all my life. But I, I said, yes, of course I know how. I didn't want to, you know, write the man off. But it, it, it's like that. He, he wasn't thinking of me as a as a black person or anything like that. He was just, mm. you know, sort of fellow Labour Party person. Mm. So, but tell me one, you know, before we move to London, one of the things yeah. that one discovered is you got to know Kamala Harris's uh, parents in, uh, yes, in the indeed, indeed, yes. uh, No, uh, yeah. uh, John, uh, uh, the, Don, Don Harris 
was an economist. He was a PhD student in economics. I was doing mm -hmm. a job because by that time I had got my PhD. I was doing mm -hmm. a job in the agricultural economics department. Mm -hmm. And uh, Shamla, uh, her mother uh, was was there. And we were sort of a group of people we used to meet, a uh, mixture of you know uh, Americans, Indians, and all that. But we were all radical. We were all mm -hmm. very, very radical people. Uh, so we used to meet. And, uh, Shaman, uh, Shamala and Don were the only married couple among us. Uh, okay. you know, the, the rest of us were sort of single. So you know, one day suddenly this, this little baby comes in his buggy, you know, and we were all very thrilled to see this, this child. Uh, you know, and you know, uh, yes, I, she was called Kamala and I, I must have said, hello, darling, how are you? But I haven't seen her since. But I kept okay. in touch with, uh, with, his, with her father a bit. Because he mm. was a fellow economist, he, he ended mm. up at Stanford. He was a professor at Stanford, mm. Mm. and he had a distinguished career. Uh, mm. He was from Jamaica, ah. but he was also a very kind of you know aristocratic Jamaican. I mean, sort of you know he was, he was a high level uh, official's uh, son, and so mm. he was a very 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 bright man. I mean, he's mm. still there, and and so uh, we we were friends, uh, and it was. It was it was good to know Shamla. Shamla was a really dynamic person. Okay. You know, like I was saying before about Indian consciousness, she mm. brought up her children mm. to think of them as black Americans. Oh, interesting. Which is which is you know which I think is the most remarkable thing that mm. she was in Berkeley. Berkeley is mm. sort of a string town. Berkeley and Oakland. Oakland is much mm. more black town. Than Berkeley is, but uh, mm. from the, uh, what I've read from the beginning, she said to her children, mm. "We are black, so we are going to be integrated with the black population." And mm. there was this idea about busing the black children to schools mm. in another area. She fought mm. for busing and all that. So she was mm. fighting the local civil rights fight, but she said, mm. "We are black." So now, in a sense, when you see Kamala Harris. You see the mm. very good combination of mm. a very confident person, mm. you know, absolutely confident person. She's fully integrated, and I'm thinking she. I think she's going to make a great vice president. There's no doubt in my mind about that, because mm -hmm. uh, and her mother was was ferociously intelligent, and of course her mm. father is a is a very clever man too. Mm. Uh, so you know, good for her. Fascinating. Fascinating. No, we'd love to see what she does uh, over the next four years. So coming back to you. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Yes, no, I'm coming, back, I'm coming back to you. So you came back to you came to London after the US. So an obvious question that arises at that time. Didn't you think of going back to India? You know, uh, did you think of what are the opportunities that could arise there? What could be done for the country? You know, not immediately. Let me put it this way. I don't know how I was thinking at that time, because, but I had one thing quite certain. I was not going to stay in America. Okay. Because there was a um, uh, draft, military draft. Oh. If you oh. got a green card, you didn't have a right to vote, but you could be drafted. And the Vietnam okay. War was going on. And okay. I had publicly taken part in demonstrations and people had got arrested. I had stood bail bond for them. And someone mm. says my name was on a you know CIA uh, FBI file. I don't know. But uh, okay. no, I decided America a lot. The question was mm. I, I guess I was still thinking in terms of Western universities, a Western mm. career, anything like that. Uh, mm. I, I must have thought a few years here and then I'll maybe go back. When somebody offers me a full professorship, anyway. Um, but but you never thought about going to Vietnam and fighting out there or something? That thought never occurred to you. No. This is this, this is I'm a Gujarat. Okay. <laughs> no, no, none of that. No. No. You know, fighting is sort of demonstrating street fighting, that sort of thing. Uh, hmm. Fighting with ideas. No. Uh, I I, so, I have to say this. My father so, had told. When I was a very small child, that he wanted to dedicate me to the Indian Army, and I had to go join the Indian Army. At some stage, he lost that him. But when I was five years old, 
I always said to people, I'm going to go to Karakwasla Academy. And oh. that, that he had told me. I think that when we transferred to Bombay, he lost all mm. that all that sort of enthusiasm because it was mm. very hard for him mm. to, to be in Bombay at a, you know, in his 50s. But uh, no, so I had lost all that. Uh, I... Yeah. I can do clearly you are a me. clearly you are a devotee of goddess saraswati and not goddess lakshmi yeah. and not goddess durga either no no not goddess <laughs> durga either. although although my, my mother was a devotee of amba amba mother ah. who, ah. who was a, okay. she she had a picture of amba riding the the tiger and uh, tiger. and with yeah. with that uh, head of you know yeah, the ferocious warrior of Warrior, well, exactly, you know. <laughs> Rob, I, you've just returned to London in your journey with, with us. I think this is a perfect okay. time to take a short break and do a launch of your book. We've got actually, you know, we are stuck with these online uh, platforms now. We can't do the ripping of the, you know, wrapping paper <laughs> and showcase the book. So we've got a wonderful online unveiling of your book which we want to show right now, and then we'll get back to the conversation. If we can draw the okay. unlo online unveiling. Very good. Thank you. For those who missed it, here's the book once again. This is what we are discussing. Lord Meghna Desai, Rebellious Lord, Fascinating read, fascinating man. Lord Meghnad, you came back to LSE. And uh, there was some, and, or rather, you came to LSE and you became a professor here. There's some talk about student troubles at LSE. Do you want to tell our yeah, audience yes. about that? Yeah, you see, it, again, it is basically what I was doing in Berkeley following me to uh, London. That was a student uh, protest about Vietnam War. Students mm. wanted to take out a march to go to Grosvenor Square in London, where the U.S. Embassy was in those mm. days. And yeah. the idea was, you know, and, and they were doing it in Paris. Paris had a, you know, we, we had some student trouble even before that. But basically, mm. it was a generation of students where people, they were saying, we don't respect our elders just because they're elders. Mm. They have to show to us mm. that they are, you know, honest, straightforward thing. And so if you make a decision which affects our lives, we want mm. to be consulted. Mm. And in LSE, it started with the appointment of a new director. The students didn't like and they were not consulted. Therefore, you know, various things happened. And mm. then, of course, it continued with the Vietnam War. And I happened to be young enough to be able to identify with them because you know i was i was about 25 when i became lecturer at lsa uh, mm. and they were sort of in their early 20s so it was easy for me to sympathize and get in uh, with them and i i more or less agreed with them that they should be consulted we should consult students and uh, and uh, kind of you know associate them uh, mm. So I was in a minority at that time in my economics department, even in the LSE. But I was never mm. worried about that. Mm. I never ever worried about promotion and nothing like that. I just said, this is what I have to do. I have to do that. And so then they made me honorary president, chairman of the student union, uh, which is likely as a joke. But uh, I ended up chairing a big meeting of students when they wanted to occupy LSC for the okay. demonstration, weekend of demonstration. And I just I just became the one person that the, uh, the bosses wanted to talk, you know, the director and so on. And the students trusted. And I had to be very careful not to presume that I represented students. Mm. I said, you want to talk to the students, I will get them and I will bring them to you. You talk to them, then I'll take them back. A very difficult thing, but I throughout was very active with the students, supported them, but never ever thought mm. I could represent them because that's a very difficult position to be in. Because mm. then people say you betrayed us. You know, mm. as soon as you say I'm your representative, the next mm. thing is 
So, you know, that's a very difficult way of doing politics. But mm. I, you know, I, I choose difficult ways of doing mm. things, not the easy mm. way. Uh, so <laughs> anyway, that, so that was that was very good for me to know them. Very good for them. We had a lot of chats about them. Of course, that's how I got teaching Marxian economics. They all wanted to have, you know, all they were all left wing. So I said, I'll teach you. Uh, mm. I have read all this because growing up in Bombay, you mm. know, Bombay was a very, very kind of left wing city in those days. You yeah. know, all of all of what we now call Bollywood was full mm. of uh, Sahil Janvi, N K Bahas, Balatsani, Bimal Roy, and so that was that was nothing new to us. Uh, mm. So again, that was that was a good friendship, and that's how we got into the left part. Yeah, you 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 came on the cover of the Economist and uh, London Times also in those days. Yes, yes, uh, and London Times was when I when I had just uh, sort of um, intervened to have an agreement done between the school officials and the students. So next oh. day, front page of uh, the Times, there I was, uh, uh, you know, Doctor Desai returning from talking to the school authorities or something like that. <laughs> oh my God, what have I done? <laughs> <laughs> and then the economist, economist had a front uh, later on when LSE shut down and another thing happened. I, uh -huh. I was on a, and, and the headline said, what did you do at the school today, daddy? <laughs> <laughs> uh, fascinating. So, so, but it was a natural progression, I guess, from there into active uh, politics uh, with yeah. labor. I guess you were. Well, you know, students, uh, as I say in my book, you know, students are a temporary constituency. They move on, they go take a job, and they fondly remember the days. But you were still there. So I thought <laughs> I had to join a political party. I had to really. <laughs> and, you know, political parties in, in UK and in America, <laughs> at least in UK, uh, <laughs> actually meet quite regularly. Every mm. month we had meetings, we have discussions, we saw our MP, our MP came in and talked to us. If there's no MP, the parliamentary candidate would come and talk to us. We would mm. discuss issues. So it was not just an election time, everybody got together. We were there mm. all the time. And mm. uh, so I joined in 1971 uh, and, uh, you know, stuck to the my, my Islington party. I, I became chairman after a while. And again, you see that by this discrimination, nobody remarked about the fact that I was probably one of the first party chair, constituency chairman uh, who was you know, who was sort of non-white, uh, mm. you know, uh, person. And then no, nobody, worried about, nobody worried about that. It's Magnat. They said, this is yeah. Magnat, Magnat is, you know, I, I when you were, uh, yeah, I mean, when you were honored and welcomed into the House of Lords as well, if I'm not mistaken, you and Baroness Flada are uh, perhaps the first among Indian origin uh, uh, lords. Yeah, of 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 recent times, because uh, there was a Lord Sinha of Raipur. Actually, okay. I, I grew up uh, knowing about it. Lord Sinha of uh, Raipur was a general of the government of India. Uh, ah. when the all, uh, capital was in Calcutta. Ah. He became only a hereditary lord, the only ah. hereditary lord, but ah. he became a member of the cabinet, Imperial War Cabinet. And he was in, a delegate to the League of Nations, founding of League of Nations. I have to admit, so, I didn't know this. <laughs> I didn't know this. <laughs> then, yeah, yeah, you know, when, when the Jallianwala Bagh thing was discussed in ah. British Parliament, he answered on behalf of the government. Really? In the House of Lords. Oh, okay. And wow. It, it, it's a fascinating, fascinating. This. I mean, he's not very well known in India now, but in my generation, mm. we knew about it. Mm. But no, uh, uh, we were, we were, uh, Srila Flatha was the first conservative Asian peer, and I was the first uh, yeah. labor. Mm. Asian peer, Indian peer, so uh, mm. uh, a trailblazer once again. Hmm? A trailblazer once again. 
<laughs> you chose a new area and you were a trailblazer once again. <laughs> but let us let us get into your writing career now. Thirty-five okay. books, and what fascinates me the most is the range you've written on, from economics to articles to uh, labor issues to fiction novels as well. Yes, how do you do really? that? I I I don't get it. How do you do that? I mean, how does one write on such a broad range of issues? You know, it's it's slightly uh, shamelessness. Uh, I'm not worried that I might be laughed at if I write a book. I just write it. <laughs> but also, you know, I you know, I'm I'm a I'm a very different sort of mentality. Once I write a book, mm. it's away from me. I never mm. worry about whether it is selling or not, you know, or mm. what, what review comes and so on and so on. See, some of our academic books, they were like mm. textbooks being used and so on, and that, that's fine. But mm. uh, since I had done theater, I also wanted to be a creative writer. So mm. my first novel was about how to murder the British Prime Minister. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a difficult thing to do. For the, you have for to the, write so that for, for the clarity of everyone here, that is clearly fiction. <laughs> exactly, clearly <laughs> fiction. But also, you have to be careful. It has to be lifelike, and you have to sort of write about living politicians mm -hmm. who are my friends. So I couldn't mm -hmm. make it too real. You know, mm -hmm. I couldn't make it Tony Blair because I was trying to you know, murder prime ministers. But you have to make it, and so. That was very nice. I took mm. that took me a long time. I mm. did uh, many drafts, and um, Ruth Rendell, uh, who mm. is a very famous crime writer, a woman crime writer, Ruth Rendell, she mm. advised me. She read every mm. draft, mm. and she, you know, I described to her the story. She said, okay, write it up. He said, mm. your problem is you only playing chess. You have this mm. plot, so you only describing the plot. What about the people? What is the life like? Develop develop a backstory for each of them. Do this, mm -hmm. do that. And so I had a very good training from mm -hmm. Ruth Rendell. And uh, it's very nice. And she wrote a nice uh, book. And unfortunately, I had a new publisher who went bankrupt. Oh. <laughs> but uh, HarperCollins have got it in India. So awesome. HarperCollins uh, also. It's called Dead on Time. OK. Harper Collins, Dead on Time. We're promoting that book as well. Out Harper Collins, make sure it's available in the UK as well. While we're yeah. talking about all this, this violent stuff, you also did something beautiful for the apostle of nonviolence, Mahatma Gandhi. Take us through that. Yes. Well, you know, uh, it, is, it is one of these uh, things, again, from friendship uh, between uh, Joe Johnson. Uh, was a correspondent for Financial Times in India. Mm. And so we became friends and we used to meet and become friends. And so then he came back and became an MP and he was in a, a cabinet office when Cameron mm. was prime minister. And mm. one day when we were going somewhere, uh, Kishwar and I, uh, I mm. get a phone call. And mm. he says, Meghna, do you think it will be a good idea to have a statue of Mahatma Gandhi in Parliament mm. Square? And mm. I had often myself thought that. Because mm. Mandela was there, mm. you know, and I said, Mandela is there, why not, why not Gandhi? Uh, mm. I said, of course it will be. So then, you know, it is kind of a, they must have thought it out in a, in a conservative cabinet office that mm. I would be a very suitable person because mm. I was Labour Party. Mm. I had an Indian background and mm. I was not going to worry about any party rivalry or anything like that. So I said, so you think, um, why don't you set up a trust? So in July, nine, July 2014, mm. uh, and uh, in the Birla house where Gandhiji died, uh, mm. along with William Hague, who was foreign secretary, and mm. George Osborne, who was the chancellor, we launched mm. this trust. Mm. And then uh, uh, Kishwar and I became the two first charity uh, trust members, and we mm. had to collect money. So the, the mm. rule is that if you have a public statue, you mm. can't use government money. You okay. have to raise money privately. And every mm. statue in Parliament Square has privately mm. raised money. Uh, okay. And the donor's name doesn't appear. 
no okay. donor's name, only so. So I said, okay, we'll do it. Mm. And not knowing, you know, it's not an easy thing to do that. But luckily, uh, people were very friendly. Kishor, I mean, I'm I'm kind of a, I'm less uh, sociable than Kishor is. She she has she has charm and she can, you know. She, oh, she's very charming. Your wife is very charming. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and so we were able to uh, in, able to appeal both to, uh, you know, British people, I guess worldwide. We got lots of small donations from around mm -hmm. the world. But, you know, maybe I, I should repeat the story I had that uh, once I was asked by the Indian Journalist uh, uh, Association in London, how was I going to advertise? So, mm -hmm. you know, me being me, I said, I'm going to sit at the post where the statue is going to be for 24 hours. And okay. some very kind person said in her report to uh, Indian newspapers, Lord Desai is going to go on a fast run to death to raise money. <laughs> and Rahul Bajaj called me. Fake next news. <laughs> Rahul Bajaj said, Meghnath, what is the problem? I will give you money. You know, and it was amazing. Fake news, real fake news. And you know, Rahul, Rahul was very sweet. Uh, mm. He said, look, my family has a lot to do with Gandhiji. Mm. And you know, yeah. if there's a Gandhi statue. And you know, in a sense, one thing about that statue is there's mm. more Indian business money from India mm. setting up that statue. Uh, Narayan Murthy. Narayan Murthy, uh, sort of, you know, I talked to him. He said, no problem. And he then, in, he gave out of his own tr family trust. And then mm. he gave from Infosys. Mm. Uh, and, you know, I mean, there's all sorts of people, very, very, you know, uh, Lakshmi Mittal gave money. And, mm. and actually, straightforwardly, no, no, no questions asked. Here's the money. Because Gandhi is a big name. Uh, and... Uh, yeah. You know, people know me, so I said fine. And so we had, uh, we had, we had very good, very, very good. Uh, Preeti Patel, who is now the Home Secretary, yeah. she was very. Uh, yeah. And so, so we were. It was hard work. Let me put it this way: it was hard work because, um, but the statue is it's a beautiful statue. It it's is a beautiful. Statue. Philip Jackson, who who did the statue and you know, became a friend as well, is a beautiful yeah. statue. David mm -hmm. Gandhi helped uh, with that. He also talked to uh, Philip Jackson when he was in London once, and in they talked about Gandhi's eyes and this and that. But mm -hmm. it's a beautiful statue, is, and even is. now, if you go into Parliament Square, it has the stature of matching the Churchill statue. Mm -hmm. It's on a high pedestal. You know, mm -hmm. the Gandhi is standing, or sort of almost about to walk. And mm -hmm. uh, there's Churchill at one end, but there's Gandhi in the, one of the best spots there is. He's looking straight mm -hmm. at Parliament, uh, mm -hmm. and it's, um, I, I think that's one of the best things that I've done in my life, to have raised money for the Gandhi statue and been part of that great process. Of course, the collective process. Uh, yeah. No, and Mahatma Gandhi, even even after his uh, his left his mortal body, is still uniting people. Because the conservatives and labor came together for that for that statue, so he's still uniting people, and many and you know, I I met uh, I, I met you and your uh, wife at actually a ceremony at that uh, at that lovely statue. And for those who don't know, Lord Meghna's wife has also written a book. We're going to launch this also hopefully sometime, and this is his book. This is the one we are discussing right now. Let's move on to your. Sorry. No, no. I mean, let's move on to your economics. Uh, you know, a bit more, a bit of coverage on that because you've covered so much ground in there. You've spoken of, uh, you know, written on the Human Development Report. You've covered many areas in macroeconomics. You were among the first, if I'm not mistaken, uh, to suggest uh, direct monetary transfer, direct benefit transfers, which actually India is implementing uh, right now. Uh, you even spoke of demonetization. I mean, in, in a different way. Uh, yeah, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. You see, I, I, the, the, uh, on a on a money transfer, I there's something called basic income guarantee uh, mm. that every citizen, 
every person who is on a voter register gets mm. a income from mm. the state. Mm. Straightforward, no questions asked. Mm. Uh, and if you're in the tax category, tax, but that's all right. Everybody gets it. Uh, mm. And uh, like a right to vote, you have a right to income. Mm. And there is a whole movement about that. And in the UK, mm. I was one of the prominent people uh, starting it in the in the 70s uh, mm. and arguing for it, and I still argue for it. If people mm. ever say, why, do, why should the rich people get the money? Why, you know, once you start asking questions, who not? Mm. Then you start cutting, you mm. know? And so no, just gave it to everybody as of right, and so no questions asked. Anyway, so I learned that. Then the, 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 the demonetization was because uh, when in the 70s and 80s, as mm. somebody who was an economist but taking interest in Indian uh, mm. problems as well, we mm. were very worried about black money. Black money mm. was a big issue we were discussing among ourselves. Mm. And after a long time, I had thought that the only way to do something is don't sort of discourage people from treating, from hoarding money. Mm. Because holding money, uh, of course, not only you escape taxation, but you can put it in the black circuit and make money, right? Mm. Why? Because the cash doesn't lose value. Now, if you threaten that the cash may become valueless, mm. it's risky. Mm. So I, I had idea that periodically the government ought to renew the currency. Mm. And I gave a lecture at the Reserve Bank of India way back in 2004, uh, in which one of the ideas I, I put forward was this. And I had a sort of fantasy about how, how I would do it. Uh, in the, I was the prime minister and I had to do it. What would I do? So on. Mm. And I would say about uh, uh, the Indian experiment that the only thing which the hitch was the new currency was not ready on time. Mm. You know, if on the first day mm. it is all there, Hmm. And there's and there's poor farce about the two thousand rupee note and and you know you know all that was unnecessary from hmm. the first day. Hmm. Anybody, you said limit hmm. one person one crore, not more than that. Hmm. Hmm. Suppose hmm. if you have more money than that, that's your problem. Please explain. Hmm. We will give you bond or something, but hmm. that could have been done. Uh, hmm. So when it happened. Uh, I was in India, uh, and I have been in support of the monetization from day one, mm. and I openly said that. Mm. See, I'm, I don't, I don't wait till something is a success and then praise it. I was mm. there. I said yes, I agree with this, mm. and uh, yes, there are problems, there are hitches, but ultimately, you know, people exaggerate how much damage mm. it may have done and all that rubbish. Mm. Uh, but you see, in a sense, I would say that every five or 10 years, we ought mm. to do it. Mm. Because in India, cash is, you know, but now it is more difficult to, to deal in mm. cash because the government is, has closed quite a lot of the loopholes in the And, and, you can't. But, and uh, the expression of, uh, but, but of online money. In 1950s, I remember my a sister was a teacher in a school uh, in, mm. in Bombay. And, you know, it was a sort of private school, uh, uh, mainly Gujarati's uh, Matunga Dadar. And she would say when she had to go raise money for the school, she would go mm. and see me as a parent. And she said mm. there would be a thing and there would be an almari. And mm. man would open it. And it was absolutely and stacked with notes. Oh. And he would just take what I was going to hear it is. In this area, people had flats with only cash in it and nothing else. <laughs> that, 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 I think, has by now gone. But I think yeah. that was very, very bad for the Indian economy. Steady. And, you know, you go to some state to say, enough is enough. We may have hardship, which is basically what the prime minister said that day. It will be hard. I remember mm. hearing the speech. It will be hard, but you've got to do it. Mm. And I think that was a great thing.
It was, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a great devotee of demonetization. <laughs> you see, this is the way, I, how I get into trouble. I always do <laughs> <laughs> so, but I mean, we're going to keep putting up audience uh, questions as well, though I have many for, more for you. But here's a question from uh, Bhavani Shekhawar. He's asking, are all rebels inherently individualistic? And that can that be limiting for a worldview? Interesting question. What do you think of that? I think you have to be individualistic. I think a rebel has to be individualistic. You know, hmm. ultimately, uh, you you have to be different. You have to be disobedient about other people's instructions. Your elders mm -hmm. are telling you, don't don't get into trouble, don't do this, don't do that. And you say, no, I'm going to do it. Now, <laughs> does it does it distort your worldview? Probably does. You know, I mean, in a sense, uh, I you know, I could be well known and I be a mentor or whatever. Uh, known as a wise person. No, I prefer to be known as a, as a rebel. Uh, hasn't done me any harm. Uh, mm. And I think uh, I have known a lot of people like that. You know, so my, 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 my preferences have taken me more to the rebellious side. But, you mm. know, I have some good friends who are not rebels. <laughs> but I am a rebel. And I think because, as I said, I'm an individualist. Can I say one thing though? One criticism of this of this book. Yeah. You make it sound too easy. You've uh, you've really have fantastic achievements. You make it sound a little too easy. Is that something that for most of us who read this, how the hell are how? Because an autobiography, you want to get inspired by. Were there? You know? Do you underplay things? Have you underplayed things in this in this book? Probably, you know, I mean, in a sense, uh, quite a lot of, well, I have, I'm, I'm a very good reader of draft uh, manuscripts. A lot of people send me. <laughs> and I think when people send it to me, especially autobiographical things, they can't stop mm. talking about themselves. Mm. You know, and I mm. wanted to just tell the story, a straight mm. story, uh, mm. not consciously, but I basically said, if I can do this, anybody can do this. The, the I wish is, life was that easy. You've achieved quite a lot. <laughs> no, it's hard work. It's a lot of hard work. Mm. You know, there is absolutely no no kind of leisure uh, and thing. Very there true. is no kind of uh, uh, taking it easy or sitting on the back. It is. I have worked now That's more right. or less from the age of four when my home tuition started. <laughs> Till now, I'm still learning. I'm still working very hard. And I, I wanted to call the book Could Do Better. Uh, Are you know, serious? I, really? Could do better with all your achievements? I was always disappointed every result I had. My mother <laughs> always was you see, he talks too much, but he doesn't you know. No, I got, and, and people said, nobody would understand what the title means. So uh, we we settled on rebellious lord. No, I think uh, uh, it is. It's hard work, hmm. but hard work, hard work plus, as I say, a bit of luck. Hmm. I'm where I am. But anybody can be here. Hmm. There's a question. Another question from Shantanu Gangagetkar. I will read yeah. out for you. Uh, Meghnath, sir, when do you believe India will become a uh, uh, excuse me, a five trillion dollar economy. Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, I think the prime minister said in 2019. I remember that uh, uh, he wanted to do it in five years. At that time, I was thinking that maybe not five, maybe seven, eight years. Now I think after the COVID, hmm. you know, we we already was the economy was turning down and the COVID. I mean, we are about ten to fifteen percent behind 2019. I think mm. it will be. I mean, I don't doubt yeah. that mm. India will be, in a, I mean, in a sense, between 1991 and 2016, let's say, mm. uh, India tripled uh, GDP. I mean, mm. basically, the Indian story is 40 years wasted uh, from yeah. 40, well, 47 to 91. Mm. 91 to onwards, 
India has become a growing economy, you know, mm. six, seven, eight percent, nine percent sort of thing. And, uh, you know, it used to be three percent and all that. Uh, yeah. No, no, I think I'm, I'm very confident about India. I'm not at all pessimistic. I mm. think, you know, when you think about it, India is as large as European Union. Mm. With twice yeah. the population. Mm. Twice population. We have as mm. many languages and more languages than the European yeah. Union has, mm. you know, and and uh, uh, that many uh, minority diversity of uh, of ethnic and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and the first democracy in the world, which mm. started with universal adult franchise. franchise. No yeah. other, no other country in the world. Mm. You know, whatever the Americans can say about their democracy, when. You won't go into that. Uh, but, uh, you know, India took a big risk mm. because the founding fathers and founding mothers were Democrats. They were mm. all utterly democratic people at heart. Mm. And I think whatever else has happened, India mm. is still a democracy. Mm. And in a sense, it's an achievement quite, quite beyond belief that a democratic mm. country from the depth of poverty Mm. can come this far without course. Yeah. You know, it, it's quite an amazing story because when, again, when I was young in the 50s, everybody mm. thought not when, not if, but when India would become communist. Right. You know, it, that you can't believe it now how prevalent the idea was that India mm. was going to have a communist revolution. It mm. was just a stage before. Mm. And we didn't do that. Mm. And, you know, a whole philosophy of the Congress philosophy of uh, between 47 and 90, Congress has rejected that when, when Narasimha Rao and Manmohan mm. Singh came out and said, enough of that old stuff, mm. we're going to go anywhere. Mm. And so since 91, it is an Indian Indian economic revolution done by Indians. Right. And we are we are still a democracy. And I think I think it's a great story to tell. Mm. Uh, and of course there are problems along the way. There always will be. Mm. You know, I mean people people don't remember that uh, uh, in France women mm. got vote in 1946. You know. And, and, mm. and in the UK in 1928, I mean, these mm. democracies are not that old. Mm. They, may, they may pretend in 1688, but in 1688, 2% of the population had a vote. Mm. So, you know, that is, that is that to say that, you know, India has set the pattern of mm. post Second World War independent countries and or anybody else. Mm. This is how to do a democracy. And I think that's a great achievement. No, no doubt, right. Absolutely. I mean, there are there are things which are worth criticizing. We should criticize, but there are certainly things worth celebrating. And uh, thank you for saying this. You know, let me let me give you another example. We were sort of middle middle class uh, people, mm. but we only had a telephone if we had a good civil servant job. Yeah. Otherwise, no telephone. Yeah, no telephone. Now there are eight hundred million people with mobile telephones. <laughs> You know, yeah. to, to say nothing about, you know, nobody cares about the, the landline, but, you know, you know, 800 million, maybe 900 million people have mm -hmm. no mobile phone. Why? Because in a sense, you know, it was, it was in the uh, BJP NDA government of 1998-2004 uh, mm -hmm. that the decision was made to go mobile. Yeah. True. And True. anybody could have it. Massive revolution. And so that's how far India has come. Yeah. You know, in rural areas, people have mobile telephone. Women are getting check on their uh, children. Are they all right at school? You call and find out, you know. That's a great true. revolution. True, true, true. Yeah, there's so many things to 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 celebrate, to be, to be positive, about, to be proud now, of. Another, Prashant Kumar uh, has a question. We'll, we'll uh, not keep you too much longer, Lord Meghnath. Prashant's question is, sir, what is your message for young, for the young generation, I assume, of Indians 
uh, who has recently settled in the UK. Integrate. Hmm. Integrate as much as you can. Make hmm. this your country. You will not lose your Indian culture doing that. But don't constantly go on looking backwards. Mm. Everywhere I have been, I have integrated. I have not lost my my feeling for India. Mm. But I am, for all practical purposes, a British citizen. Mm. And I always behaved like that. You know, I remember being at one of those Pravasi things. We had a regional Pravasi thing a few years ago. Mm. And the people were there, uh, Britons, telling our High Commissioner, Sir, we have got such and such problem. What, you, what is the government when they're going to do about it? I said, Government of India has no purpose doing anything for your complaint. Go to your MP. Mm. You, know, you have an MP, go to your MP, ask your MP what to do. When you live here, you should mm. use this government to solve your problems. Why do you want the Indian government? So I think one mm -hmm. thing I have to say to all Indians settled in UK, integrate, mm -hmm. play your part in the local culture, in the mm -hmm. local politics, in the local society. Mm -hmm. When you want to go back, you go back and become fully Indian citizen. While mm -hmm. you're here, okay. you know, not direct in, as always. In ka namak khana hai. <laughs> Lord Meghna, direct as always and ending with a Bollywood line so I'm not going to let you go because oh, wow. we all know that you love Bollywood music and apparently and if I'm not if my research isn't wrong you showed the Mughal Azam at the House of Lords as well if, uh, if I'm not wrong so okay. what is the one song that will sum up your life and may I request that you sing that song Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, hey, you opened the door to Bollywood. Yeah, well, you know, let me, let me let, the, most, the most suitable, I'm just thinking very uh, uh, quickly. Uh, hmm. uh, I think Mera Juta Hai Japani. Ah, nice. You know, I mean, I am wearing <laughs> English Tani trousers anyway. <laughs> A patloon English tani, Serpe lal topi rusi jacket, Serpe lal topi rusi, Firbi dilha Hindustani, and that is me. What a, what a wonderful, wonderful uh, moment to end this, this fascinating show on. All of you, check out this book, Meghna Desai, Rebellious Lord, available in India and the UK. A fascinating book of a deeply fascinating man. Thank you so much, Lord Meghnath, for coming to the Nehru Center platform and uh, sharing your valuable knowledge, time with us, and for singing so well. Thank you. Someday, <laughs> someday I may repeat that if you ask me again. So don't worry. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for watching. And uh, buy the book. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.